said I was in my early forties with a lot of life before me. When a moment came that stopped me on a dime, I spent most of the next days looking at the X-rays, talking about the options, and talking about sweet time. I asked him when it sank in. This might really be the real end. How's it hit you when you get that kind of news, man? What you do? And he said, I went skydiving, I went Rocky Mountain climbing, I went 2.7 seconds on a full name blue mansion. Said someday I hope you get the chance to live like you were dying. He said I was finally the husband that most of the time I wasn't. And I became a friend a friend would like to have. All of a sudden, going fishing wasn't such an imposition, and I went three times that year. I lost my dad. Well, I, I finally read the good book, and I took a good long hard look at what I'd do if I could do it all again. And then I went sky. Rocky Mountain climbing, I went 2.7 seconds on a full name blue mansion. And I looked deeper and I spoke sweeter and I gave forgiveness I've been denying. And he said, someday I hope you get the chance to live like you were dying. And you got eternity to think about what you do with it. What did you do with it? What did I do with it? What would I do with it? Skydiving, I went. Rocky Mountain climbing, I went. Two point seven seconds on a full day. How's that? There we go. Good morning. How's the family this morning? Oh boy, excitement everywhere. Y'all didn't know I was an artist. I'm going to draw pictures today. Don't hold me to that, that artist thing there. Hey, let's thank the band for the job they do. What great music this morning. Appreciate you. Let's talk to God first. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you this morning humble. Father God, we're, we're just so thankful for the grace and mercy you show upon us that we know we're not deserving. But Father, I pray that you be with us this morning. 
that your presence just fill this building. And Father, that you'd put your hand over my mouth, that everything that comes from me comes from you. Father, not from me. Father, I pray that you just move me over out of the way. And Father, that everything revealed here today would be pleasing, glorifying, and uplifting to you. We ask this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. You know, I love this song, and, and it seems like all of you, or many of you, know every word. You didn't need the words on the screen. You know every word to the song. You may not catch all the meaning, but I'll tell you, I love the song. I, I love what it uh, portrays to be in our life. I will tell you this, I'm not going skydiving. I'm not Rocky Mountain climbing, and I ain't riding no bull. That ain't going to happen, Okay. Some of the other stuff that he talks about, we could all learn from that right there real quick. In, the, in this song, he says, I love deeper and I spoke sweeter. Now think about just those two lines. Those two lines, the depth of that, that we all should be about. I loved deeper. You know, from time to time, we'll tell someone, hey, I love you. You do your spouse, you do your kids, and you have friends in them that you do that way. Now, guys, I know you have a hard time with that sometimes, and we're not talking about the broke back mountain love and all that kind of stuff. We're talking about true love to a brother and sister that you love one another, right? Oh, did I go somewhere I wasn't supposed to go there? He says, I spoke sweeter. Rather, my words, to me, that says my words were the words of God. I spoke sweeter. I spoke in the way that God would expect me to speak to another person. So the song really reflects a lot of that. And he says, I gave forgiveness. I've been denying. You know, we've talked about that in the last couple of weeks, about how we should be about forgiveness. And he says he gave that forgiveness that he'd been, been withholding, basically. He said, I finally was the husband. Finally was the husband that most time I wasn't. Where we fall down, he's all, basically his whole life is flashing before his eyes because he knows he's got this short period of time to live. That the end is near. If you had, if you knew right up front you only had 30 days left to live, would you live your life different this morning? Would it start right now? Would you change a lot of things going on in your life? Sure you would. People may say, no, I'm going to be the same. No, he's not. Because... God's got a hold of you. And God's the only answer when you get to that point. So some people say, well, I've been this way all my life. Well, there's lots of people who've been a certain way all their life, though. God tapped them in the back of the head and said, hey, maybe you need to listen to me for a while. I like it where he says, and I became a friend. A friend someone would like to have. And all of a sudden, going fishing wasn't such an imposition. I never make that imposition anyway. So. And I like this part. I went three times the year I lost my dad. Me and my dad were good friends. We fished together a whole lot. That was how I got into fishing. In the last year before my dad died, me and his cousin that was about 85 years old, we went fishing once a week, every week for nearly a whole year. We barely missed any of those days. And when that was going on, that whole year, at that time, I did not know that my dad wasn't going to be with me very much longer. I didn't know he had cancer. He didn't know. But I sure didn't know he wasn't going to be with me in the following year. So I got that opportunity, as he said, and that's a very valuable opportunity in our lives, that we spent that time together. And he says, I finally read the good book. I finally read what God's word was and what it meant. You know, by reading the good book made it easier to speak sweeter and love deeper. Amen? So it's all, he puts it all together. And he said, I took a long look at what I'd do if I could do it all over again. Don't we all wish that in some way? That maybe we could back up just a little bit and repair that stuff, you know, that we might have just made little mistakes on. Don't we wish that opportunity was there to do it all over again? And it says like tomorrow was a gift and you've got eternity. So what would you do with it?
all that stuff you think about, could I go back and could I redo this? Could I fix this? If you come to know Jesus Christ and you accept Jesus Christ, then you're doing it all over again. All that goes away because you've given it to Him. It's in the past. And that's where it needs to be. That you shouldn't carry that kind of stuff around with you. So I'd like to ask you a couple of questions this morning. Two questions. First, what are you doing with your dash? Second, what does your dash look like? You have to think about that, and you think, I've already lost my mind because I didn't explain, but we're going to get there. And I want to be clear on this. We only get one dash. We only get one dash. Nobody gets two, only one dash in your life. So this morning, right here today, would be a real good time for us to deal with this question because life is short. James 4.14 tells us you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Life is short. So why don't we deal with all this stuff that you think you have going on in your life right now. And why don't we look at the dash in your life and see how we can make that better. I was reminded this week about how important our dash is. I had an aunt that was 96 years old, passed away, and I went to her uh, service. And the pastor talked about the dash in her life. And it reminded me of how important that was, that sometimes we overlook that. And uh, i got my little pen here. I'm going to draw you a picture here because this is how I want to explain it to you. I hope everybody can see this. We're going to write, right here is our birth date. And here is our you got a dash and a death. Oops. Excuse my writing date. And we're talking about the dash right here in the middle, in between these days. We're talking about from the day you're born till the day you die. That's your dash. That's your life. Not just a dash in the deal. This is the dash if you go out into any cemetery and you look at a tombstone or a gravestone, headstone, whatever you call it, and you look at the day a person was born and the day they die, there's always a dash right in the middle. That dash is their life. Their life between the time they were born and the time they died. And it's pretty clear that we have no control over either one of these dates. We have no control over that all. That is determined by God himself. Not by us. So we don't get to decide when we're born. We don't get to decide when we die. That's all up to God, not up to us. So we have no control over that. We do, however, have control over the dash in between these two dates. We have full control over that. Believe it or not. Some people say, hey, that's not so true. Yes, it is. We can control what happens in between our birth and our death. That da dash actually reveals how close, how we choose to live our lives. It, it reveals right from birth where we go from there. How we choose to live our life, it reveals what we've accomplished and how people are going to remember us when we're no longer on this earth. All that in this little dash in between. That's how important it is. That's why I say I was reminded at that time how important that dash is. Now that you understand the question and you know what the dash is, what are you doing with your dash and what does your dash look like? You know, you have to reflect on that. Each one of us has a different thing there. For all of you here today, here's where your dash is right now. That's where you're at right now in your life. So there's no ending to it. So why can't this be added to? Why can't you start to work on this dash in between? Because there's no end. Today's that day. 
you've actually been filling your dash with all kinds of things ever since the day you were born. Some good, some not so good. And many of you know that. I guess the question could be asked, are you living it or are you wasting it? Which are you doing with your dash? Are you living the dash where you know fully who you are and why you're here? Are you living that type of life? Or could you be wasting your dash, doing things that will not matter after you leave this earth? What does that mean? Are you sweating the small stuff? Are you letting the devil steal your joy in your life because you're so upset about stuff that's not even going to matter the day you leave this earth? Irrelevant in your life. Because people do. People love drama. Love drama. That's why the internet does so well. People love drama. So, if you've been feeling this with some good and some bad, but you know Jesus Christ, it's time to fill it with good. How are people going to remember you? What are they going to say about you when you leave? You know, that's, that's, to me, we can say, well, I don't really care what anybody else thinks. Great. I care about what God thinks. Okay? So that dash should be godly. Amen? And that's the way we should look at things. God wants us to grow up like Christ in everything we do. We take our own lead from Christ, who is the source of everything we do. So why would we not want to be like Jesus, right? Ephesians 4.15, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head. That is Christ. Amen. So why would we not want him leading our lives? Why would we not want him helping us fill this dash in our life? Your obituary, when you die, reveals a great deal about your dash. How will your family and friends remember you? Will they have good memories about how you lived your life? Or are they going to have a lot of bad memories about how you lived your life? This week, there's been a lot of attention on the internet and in the news about the dash of a man named Leslie Ray Charpin. Many of you may know what's going on there. Seems his own family members apparently did not like him very much. And they wrote an obituary that reflected how they felt about him and what his dash looked like to them. It reads, Leslie Ray Charpin was born in Galveston on November 20th, 1942, and passed away January 30th, 2017, which was 29 years longer than expected and much longer than he deserved. Leslie battled with cancer in his later years and lost his battle, ultimately due to being the horse's butt he was known for. He le- they, I fixed the word there. It wasn't as bad. He leaves behind two relieved children, a son, Leslie Roy Charpin, and daughter, Sheila Smith, along with six grandchildren and countless other victims, including his, an ex-wife, relatives, friends, neighbors, doctors, nurses, and random strangers. At a young age, Leslie quick, quickly became a model example of bad parenting combined with mental illness and a complete commitment to drinking, drugs, womanizing, and being generally offensive. Leslie enlisted to serve in the Navy, but not so much in a brave, patriotic way, but more as a part of a plea deal to escape sentencing on a criminal charge. While enlisted, Leslie was a Navy boxing champion and went on to sufficiently embarrass his family and country by spending the remainder of his service in the Balboa Mental Health Hospital receiving much-needed medical health care services. Leslie was surprisingly intelligent. However, he lacked ambition and motivation to do anything more than being reckless wasteful and squandering the family savings and fantasizing about get-rich-quick schemes. Leslie's hobbies included being abusive to his family, expediting trips to heaven for beloved family pets, and fishing, which he was less skilled than he previously mentioned. Leslie's life served no other obvious purpose. He did not contribute to society or service community. He possessed no redeeming qualities besides quick-witted sarcasm which was amusing during his sober days. With Leslie's passing, he will be missed only for what he never did, 
being a loving husband, father, and good friend. No services will be held. There will be no prayers for eternal peace and no apologies to the family he tortured. Leslie's remains will be cremated and kept in the barn until Ray, the family donkey's wood shavings, run out. Leslie's passing provides that evil does, in fact, die and hopefully marks a time of healing and safety for all. This man's family evidently wanted everyone to know the truth about this man. Seems they did not like him in life, and just because he died, they didn't like him any better. He had made a mess of things. His dash wasn't a good one, evidently. Now, I know the Bible says we're about forgiveness, and we should be quick to forgive. But the Bible also tells us that God will rid this world of evil. And there are some evil people in this world. And it's sometimes it's very, very hard to find that forgiveness. And evidently this man had done so much that that's how he's remembered. That's what his dash looks like to many people, friends and family. I hope there's no one here today that has a dash that looks like that. But in our lives, we must think and act like Jesus Christ. Philippians 2.5, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus. The same mindset. Let's think about what Jesus Christ's dash looked like. Let's do it this way. If this was Jesus' birth, Jesus' death, it doesn't end there. There's another dash for Jesus. He gets more than one. It doesn't end right there. Because right here we have the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And then he, raised, he is raised. And the dash goes on. On and on and on and on. So when I said you don't get two dashes, that's not necessarily a true statement. Because you have the same eternal life promised to you as Jesus Christ has. But it's what you do in your first death. It's what you do with that dash while you're here on earth that makes a difference in how you're reflected to others and what we do for others. But if we're committed and we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, our dash can go on and on and on in heaven. But what about right now? We should all understand that God did not breathe life into our bodies and knit us together in our mother's womb so we would just live our lives for ourselves. But some people believe that. The Bible says we should be about others. It's not about us. It's not about us. We should be about others always. God made all of us for a purpose. We were not created just to be created. We have a purpose here on earth. Psalms 139, verse 16. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them come to be. Amen. God put you here for a purpose. Your days are ordained. He knows the day you were going to be born, He knew the day you were going to die. It's what you do in between that is very, very important to God. That is your purpose. You may think that your your life doesn't matter. Many people see it that way. And all the sinful things in your life are always going to be in your dash. It's always going to be there. My dash is not going to get any better. I've had these sinful things go on in my life. But our lives are a gift from God. And what we do with our lives matters to God. So if you're thinking for any minute that your life does not matter, it may not matter to you, and that may be your thinking, but it matters to God. And believe it or not, it matters to your friends and your family and everyone around you if you're doing it right. When we give our life to Christ and start living for Him, our dash will change. 
we have the opportunity to change our dash just like God changes our life. Same way, when God comes into your heart, everything starts to change. Remember Paul? What do you think Paul's dash looked like before, before God got a hold of him? Before he was struck down on the road to Damascus and blinded, what do you think his dash looked like? But look what God did for him. God made him one of the most powerful entities for him in, in, in sharing the word of anyone. A man that's dash was just terrible. But he made it all good again. So how do we remember Paul? We do remember Paul had some bad stuff in his life, but do we remember that part more than we remember the part where he did all the good work for Jesus Christ? I don't think so. I think that shows us that we all have a purpose. And I think that shows us if we continue to be on that evil way or that bad path, God's going to strike us down and say, hey, it's time you work for me. It's time you did it my way. That's why many of us are here today. God thumped us in the head and said, hey, you're doing it wrong. Let me show you a better way to do things. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 2, verse 14. Philippians chapter 2, verse 14. It says, do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among, the, among them like the stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice, on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with, with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Be blameless. Live the life that you should lie, live. Be that light. Be that light on the hilltop that shines for everybody else. Improve your life daily. And worship God in everything you do. Let's start making our dash our testimony. That's where you start. Make your dash your testimony. Someone talked to me this week and, and brought it to me. I won't give you any names, but they had a little confusion between a testimony and a devotional. The testimony is your life. The testimony is this dash right here. Now, you may have some rough stuff in your past, and that may be part of your testimony, but what Jesus Christ is doing for you today and what brought you here is the testimony they need to hear. That he took you out of a bad place, and he fixed it. You know, sometimes we say, Jesus Christ is like a guy that works for the dump. People go, whoo, man, I can't believe you said that. Well, you can dump all your trash at his feet, and he'll clean it up. Amen? And that's what we need to do. Our dad should tell a story of a life lived like we were dying. I'd like to close today with a scripture from Hebrews. If you turn with me there, please turn to Hebrews chapter 12, begin at verse 1. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witness, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of faith. Amen. You need Jesus Christ in your life. And you need to improve your dash. All of us do. There's always room for improvement. But you can't do it just by showing up here on Sunday morning. It's a lifetime commitment. It's this dash right here. It's what you're doing with it. Somebody does something to us that we really don't agree with. Should we get angry? Should we voice that? We do things all the time. 
that upset God. And He shows grace and mercy upon us for that. So why should we be any different in showing grace and mercy upon someone else? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen? Why can't we do it right here instead of waiting until we get there? Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we come to you this morning once again, Father God, and we are just, we're just humble, Father. We thank you for the love you show and your grace and mercy upon us. Father, we thank you that you cared enough to send your one and only son to die on the cross to cover the sins and shortcomings in our lives. And Father, that the dash in our life means so much. That how we live our life today and how it reflects to others. Father, I pray today that each and every one of us reflect the good light. The light you've placed in our heart that they can see that and see you all over us. Father, and that we would show that same grace and mercy upon others as they show, as you've shown upon us. And Father, I pray today that we continue to follow you as you lead us in this new development going on in our church. Father, I thank you today for everyone here that they took the time to come and be in pray, praise and worship to you. And Father, I pray your hand upon each one of them as they leave here today. Father, that you would just give them that overwhelming presence that you provide for anyone that wants it. Father, we love you. I pray today that everything we did, everything we said, was uplifting, glorifying, and pleasing to you. And I ask this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. I want to share with you one more thing real quick. You may be struggling with some things going on in your life. You may be think your dash isn't that strong. But today I want you to be able to add to that. I want you to be able to say, hey, I did something pretty cool today. At 12.30 we're going to cross over to the property where we're going to build a new church building. If you haven't seen the plans, the temporary plans are on this back wall. It kind of shows where it's going to sit on the property. It kind of shows what it's going to look like inside. So we're going to, we've got the plans back there. Mr. C.J. Smith went over here and drilled a big old six-foot hole right in the middle of that building where it's going to go. And we've got a little time capsule. We've got a Bible that we want you to come and be part of. We have pages in there, blank pages. We want each and every one of you to sign your name on there or put anything you want on there, but we want you to be part of that. We've got a cross in there with a cowboy prayer in it. And the youth just asked me if they could all sign their names and put something in there about their youth group from here. And I said, get with it. So we're going to put that in that hole. And we're going to pray over that property. And we're going to pray over that building. And then each one of you have the opportunity to come throw sand in that hole and be part of the building of that building. And then after that building's built and that concrete's poured, before that happens, we're going to take our GPS and we're going to mark that hole. And we're going to put a marker right where that is that we're standing on the Word of God. Come be part of that at 1230.